At the league, all things are possible. They're just not always probable. Hi, everybody. It's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. Our sure-to-be rowdy panel today includes Charles Style, political columnist for The Record, USA Today Network, Lilo Staten, healthcare writer for NJ Spotlight News, and Fred Snowflack, columnist for Insider NJ. Lots of energy at the League of Municipalities Conference in Atlantic City this week, including what I thought was a feisty panel of the legislative leadership of both parties. We got a chance to talk to Senate President Nick Scutari outside the convention center afterwards. Uh, let's take a look at that and then we'll come back with the panel. You just came out of a, a panel there with uh, other legislative leaders and I was surprised to see so much conversation about affordable housing. I didn't hear a lot of that during the campaign that just got completed. You're absolutely right, but I wasn't surprised because that was the same stuff that folks talked about last year, so I wasn't necessarily surprised by it, but put a lot of money into affordable housing this past year in the budget process. How do you solve this problem? I mean, I look at a city like Jersey City, which is a boom city. They don't want to build affordable housing unless they get super incentives from the municipality, and then the suburban areas don't want it because they say they don't want to put people out in the middle of nowhere, et cetera. How, where, where's the middle ground? It's a complicated issue, and that's a good question, and one that I don't have a succinct answer for right at this point, because it's certainly not something we're going to solve in lame duck. It's not as simple as that, that's for sure. Yeah. All right, let's talk about lame duck. Um, what's left to be done there? Oh, there's tons of stuff to be done. I'll pick one or two. How about that? Sure. Let's talk about Oprah ref reform, yes. which came up uh, today. You say it needs to be reformed. Others say that you're closing the door on transparency. No, absolutely not. Transparency is in the eye of the beholder, and we're going to make sure that transparency is there, but we can't allow continued data mining, weaponization, and just people making money off the process. It was not, in my estimation, it wasn't meant to create entire business entities that towns had to hire multiple folks in order to comply with these requests and they get penalized. I think Oprah was really meant for people to have access to information to see where government was spending money and not necessarily to allow for outside entities to now mine this data, put it into batches, and then sell it to other types of uh, business entities. It really wasn't meant for that. But then you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. These businesses aren't able to take advantage of, of this data mining uh, process. But also, folks might not be able to get the information that they want for whatever legitimate reasons. Well, I agree. We need a balanced approach. But we, maybe people have to pay for that access to that information and not two cents a page, where people are under the gun to get this information about how many dog licenses were issued or how many fence licenses were issued. I don't think that was really the intent of the framers of that, uh, of that act. It was really more about having access to information for spending purposes. So what do these reforms look like? An increase in, in fees for information? No, it's all on the table. There hasn't been, we haven't formulated a written bill yet. Those conversations are happening. They're gonna happen quickly and hopefully we'll put something together. And if not ready, we won't get it done. All right, how about um, ELEC reforms? We saw this past uh, cycle where uh, groups were able to create phantom candidates and not have to report either in advance or until way after. Is that something that needs to be looked at? Well, certainly we're lucky that we did raise the spending limits because every one of my committees were, were reported on. And I'm not certain that these committees that were formed, which we didn't have any role to play in, uh, weren't following the rules that were already there. So you need to see a fuller scope of what occurred before we go ahead and make changes again. But even before this issue came up, the idea of reforms uh, to this process were already being uh, talked about, that the system wasn't perfect. Uh, I think you even said that when it was passed. What kind of stuff do you think needs to be tweaked? Well, I'm not certain. I mean, we got to look at it. But I can tell you that the fact of what we did in terms of raising limits did bring more transparency to what people donated. You could see every single dollar that was given to the Senate Leadership Pack, the Assembly Leadership Pack, our individual ones, senators that were in, in tough races, you saw who gave. And that was the main crux of what that legislation did. All right, so let's move to offshore wind. Um, dead? It's kind of breezy here in Atlantic City, right? Yeah, well, that's why they have them already here. Uh, I mean, in terms of what the, the pullout was, yeah, I guess it is for now. I mean, we'll see what happens in the future. but. 
I don't see that happening. I mean, the one thing that the Senate put in there was millions of dollars that were supposed to be given and held aside for the state. And we'd like to try to get that money. It was guaranteed. Uh, but I see that there's already ensuing going to be litigation because they're not just going to hand it over. So uh, you're, you're in favor then of, of taking these guys to court for the... Well, I'm always in favor of resolution, but I mean, if they've made a deal, they should stick with it. They made a deal on the promise of what we were going to do in terms of tax abatements for them. None of that was conditioned on them going forward with the project. Now that they're not going to go forward with it, doesn't mean that they shouldn't have to pay for what we did for them to the taxpayers. You've got um, two other projects that already went out to bid. Um, if somebody bids on those, are you inclined to say, hey, let's help these guys with some... Uh, incentives from the state. Uh, I don't know if I'm inclined to do that or not. I'd have to see that. You haven't seen it? No. So you don't know? I don't know. All right. So, but what does this mean to the governor's clean energy plan? I, I certainly a setback for sure, uh, but we've got, I've always said we should look at energy in a holistic approach uh, and move against, again, away from some of the most pollutants, but look at other sources of energy. Uh, I don't think wind is going to solve all the problems in terms of what energy needs. I mean, you can't go to full electrification if you don't really have the electricity or the grid to support that. So I think we've got to make substantial changes in the grid and where we get our energy from. I know Senator Smith's been working on some small batch nuclear uh, options, and I think that's something that has been shown to produce a lot of energy more uh, consistently than when the wind blows. You think that um New Jersey uh, residents, voters are, are ready to embrace nuclear energy over wind or and or solar. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's something that we could just we can talk about. I mean, nuclear power has been around for a long time, uh, safer than it's ever been before, uh, and it should be an option for energy. If we need energy, that's some place that you can certainly get it, and it's not a pollutant. I don't know of uh, if this is something that you'd pick up in lame duck, but. What about funding for New Jersey Transit? I mean, the governor says it's going to be there, and then everybody said, oh, wait till this election is done, and then these guys are going to come up with a solution. So, Well, I tell you one thing that I've talked about in terms of a funding source would be a reinstitution of the corporate business tax that was suspended. Uh, that's an energy that, I mean, that's a, uh, a funding source that would provide a billion dollars a year, and that sounds about what they need. Uh, so that might be an area where we can talk about. That's something you support? It's certainly something that I could support. I mean, I, I haven't been a big fan of trickle-down economics. And this is a corporate business tax for the most, uh, the richest companies in America that are located here in New Jersey. And this small percentage that we've given back to them, I don't see that coming down. They're not hiring additional workers with that. It's going to their bottom line profit. And I, I think everybody should make a profit. But there are drastic needs in New Jersey for tax revenue. Uh, and that's one that won't hurt the taxpayers. Judicial vacancies? Is it a crisis? You seem to suggest that it wasn't entirely a crisis. Well, we're going to do what our job is required. We're going to advise and consent on the nominations that we get in a timely fashion, and we're working on that. What were your takeaways from this past week's elections? A good night for Democrats. Is it that the Republicans had a bad message or bad messengers? I think it's a combination of both. I mean, I consistently said that the Senate Democrats had the best candidates, and that was up and down the ballot, especially, uh, particularly in these districts that were seen to be uh, competitive districts, but it turned out they weren't that competitive. I mean, Vin Gopal, uh, and Assemblyman Moriarty, Assemblyman Berzicelli, Assem uh, Senator Zwicker, Senator Lagana, outstanding candidates, outstanding public servants. I always felt confident that all of them were going to win, um, and that's what they did. And they won in, in considerable fashion uh, because that they ran get excellent campaigns, and we were right on the issues. I mean, I've never seen taxes not come up in an election because we had already produced a message of, of tax relief for, the, for New Jersey, and so there wasn't anywhere to go on that. Any thoughts on the First Lady's announcement this week that uh, she's going to run for U.S. Senate? I just heard about that today, so really haven't given it all that much yet, but uh, we'll, we'll, that remains to be seen. All right, Senator, appreciate it, man. My Thank pleasure. You. I just heard about it today, he said. All right, panel, Charlie, Lilo, Fred, good to see you all. It's the League of Municipalities edition of Roundtable. I felt like there was a lot of stuff uh, happening People going to panels and politicians running around, shaking hands and all that. Fred, I saw you in the lobby on your way to the Insider NJ cocktail reception. Open bar? Who was at that? A lot of people are there. I guess an open bar tends to attract a lot of people. I mean, some of the notables, <laughs> I saw Jack Cittarelli there, who's obviously running for governor on the Republican side. Steve Sweeney was there as well, and they enjoyed a little hug. It was very nice to see bipartisanship in action. 
Albie Osiris was there, late, late a member of Congress and now the mayor of West New York. And I asked Albie, I knew the answer. I said, I bet you don't miss Congress. And he said, no, he doesn't miss it one. He doesn't miss what's going on in Washington for one minute. And that, that's to be expected. I, I, I don't know if what he was wearing when, when you saw him, but when we talked to him, he had on a black turtleneck and he looked like 30 years younger. So leaving Congress uh, can be beneficial to your Indeed. health. What, what did you think about what you saw down there? Did you think it was lively? Did it seem like the, the league is back? Well, I mean, it definitely wasn't lively. I mean, I mean, obviously, an open bar is going to be pretty lively. It's always going to attract the crowd. I also <laughs> went to a, a Republican gathering, and that was a little more bit more, somewhat more sensitive. Republicans were trying to figure out what went wrong. You know, before the election, they were bravely talking about gaining seats in the legislature and their wildest dreams. They thought they might win control of at least one house. And we know that didn't even come close to happening. And Republicans really did not, I thought, did not really have a legitimate answer. I know you spoke about that with Nick Scatari. They, they, some, some of them told me privately they didn't think they had, they, they needed better candidates. I guess you always need better candidates if you lose. But, but there was no real, no real answer as to why they did, did, did not do as well as they were supposed to. I thought it was interesting that a lot of Republicans I talked to pointed out to their wins in in towns and counties where they were frankly supposed to win, and that that was their big takeaway from it. So, yeah. Lilo, I saw you on level two. You were looking up and and turning around all at once. I, I was gonna uh, call out, but I wasn't one hundred percent sure that it was you. But you looked a little turned around. It was me, and I just want to say, whoever designed that convention hall it should be court-martialed, I mean, or tried or something. It is unbelievably bad design. Um, but that aside, um, David, I think you got uh, more than I would have thought. I mean, you got a lot out of that conversation with um, the Senate president. I I was sort of underwhelmed by... Um, by the, whole the, thing. the legislative panel. I guess yeah. my real takeaway from that um, was, you know, there are all these towns um, and local leaders who are, they may be political, but they're really there because of their day job, which is to, you know, get paving contracts and like make sure the potholes are filled yeah. and you know they it's it's sort of they're there and you know maybe they have a good time but they're also actually learning you know how to do better contracting or tax collection or whatever the issue and there just seems to be a huge disconnect between them and um sort of the elected officials at least on the on the state level um you know the elected officials that seem to sort of be almost like mini celebrities and, you know, kind of get ushered around and their appearances, everybody's so thrilled when they show up, but it's like, you know, these are, it, 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 there doesn't seem to be this sort of collaborative partnership that I would think would be, you know, an opportunity at this event. I mean, I will say I learned a lot at the, at the event I went to, which was a, a, uh, presentation by Dr. Bast and the the acting health commissioner, but but just as far as the sort of legislative give and take part, um, y you know, I wonder how how much local officials get out of it these days. Yeah, I think there's a certain amount of oh, this is like one of the one of the the film screenings at a film festival that that everybody ends up wanting to go to. Uh, you also got an award. Tell us about that. Okay. I did. Thank you. That was from the New Jersey Association of County and City Health Officials, um, who have been a great source to um, to us over the last year. And I, I should shout out to their current president, Chris Merkel, who works in Monmouth County, who also sent us a really funny letter at the beginning. Well, I think it's funny at the beginning of the year saying, you know, you guys do great work at Spotlight, um, but, you know, you might want to actually consider talking to some local health officials once in a while because we're the actual boots on the ground. And, you know, it's one of those good point taken. You can't always talk to the yeah. point experts, you know, you get it. Yeah, you, you can actually talk to the people doing the job. And it's been, yeah, it's we can, been a good we can sometimes forget that when we're 
We're, yep. we're used to going to, to sources all the time. The it's associations are the, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you got to actually talk to the people who are doing that work. Yeah. yeah. You know, we took a break uh, while we were walking around and, and we're sitting adjacent to this uh, other uh, workshop that was going on. And man, just to sit through the dense information that those people were going through, you better get certified just for sitting through an hour long <laughs> presentation like that. So props to those people who do that work yeah. every day. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Uh, Charlie, the first lady announcing her Senate run right in the middle of the conference by video release, which is how a lot of people are doing it now, evidently. Uh, how did the launch go? Well, I, it was slick. Uh, it, um, it, it, I think it was the first time people have heard her voice, and I think she, I think overall, she introduced her the, she, the her, who she is quite well. Um, I, I, I think the vid, as in terms of the video goes, but I think there is still, and I think you've alluded this uh, to this in your interview with her. I think there's still a lot of grassroots discontent that um, she's going to have to address about this, uh, what seems to be this entitled fix for her to get this job. And uh, she's going to have a lot of work uh, to do to um, douse that out. Did she handle that effectively, do you think, or does she still have a lot of work to do in that regard? I, I think she still has a lot of work to do. I mean, she had yeah. her answers. They sounded well prepared. She knew this question was going to come. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, there's the, the, the problem is there has been this slow, steady uh, campaign uh, about the line uh, that has come from the left, from the progressive wing of the party. And it, it's not going away anytime soon. It's been building. She drops in this campaign as exhibit A of potentially an exhibit A of why the, the system should be changed. So I think she, it's, it's going to be a tough, uh, tougher than it looks. Somebody coined the phrase uh, Tammany Murphy this week, which I thought was, was pretty good. Go ahead, Lilo, you wanted to say. I was going to, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's important to recognize that she has put um, certain issues on the map in New Jersey in a way that nobody had before, um, maternal child health, maternal health in particular, racial disparities in health and maternal health particularly. Um, it, it, and that is not a small thing because there are organizations that have been fighting for decades to get people to, to focus on that. And there's now huge money and focus on that. However, it strikes me that she comes from this, this position and I recognize it a little bit from you know, the Corzine administration and others where it tends to be wealthier people, but executives in business who have been extraordinarily successful, who argue, I'm the best person for the job and here are all the reasons, but are a little bit blind to the process, right? And the sense that there are people that, you know, may be great in other ways, but don't have that, you know, but are working through a process, you know, whether it's a political process or, a, you know, or a structural corporate coming up through the ranks thing, um, or whether it's government policy, like there are ways to develop things with, with coalitions and with allies, and you work with groups in the legislature, and you have to talk to lobbyists, you know, you don't just find the best thing necessarily and drop it into place. And I think it, there's a little bit of this sort of, I, I I think it's executive. It's not necessarily wealth. It's executive sort of blindness. Like I'm the best person for the job. Why wouldn't they pick me? It, it's a little bit not, I think, recognizing the contribution that other people are doing to build things along the way, if you will. Right, right. Uh, Fred, she's got Hudson behind her. She's got Camden behind her now. Uh, did you get a chance to follow her down there? Uh, what's the buzz around it if there was a buzz? Well, I think the buzz is what's already been discussed. She has the political machines behind her in two significant counties, as you mentioned, in, as far as the Democratic Party is concerned, Hudson and Camden. But it's also the rank and file. And, you know, we see this a lot. I mean, this is not new. We have Bob Menendez and Bob Menendez, two Bob Menendez in an office, Tom, going back further, Tom Kane Sr. and Tom Kane Jr. So this, this is certainly not unheard of, but it's a legitimate question. 
everything that has been said so far about what she's done regarding infant mortality and things of that nature, if she wasn't the first lady, if she wasn't married to Phil Murphy, would she even be a Senate candidate? And we know the answer is no, she would not be. So, I mean, that's, that's the issue. Maybe some people don't care about that. But then again, I think some people do. And I really think that's the issue in the primary. It's that it maybe the rank and file Democrats who have some, some shred of idealism against uh, basically the political machine. It's yeah, going to be it's fun the, to watch. It's the line, the line, the line. Charles, uh, lame duck session. You heard the Senate president being all coy there in Atlantic City. Uh, sometimes stuff gets done during lame duck, but other times not so much. Any sense of, of uh, what they're likely to take up during the upcoming lame duck session, or is it just going to be lame? <laughs> well, I, I think they, they're always a little cagey because um, I think they come in after the election with a lot of people with competing interests. Um, I think this uh, Oprah reform, public records reform, is probably going to get taken uh, addressed in some capacity. I think there's a real um, uh, alarm about that, um, whether, as you expressed, the you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater uh, kind of approach by shutting down these, uh, you know, this data mining aspect, this pressure that town clerks now have to face and, you know, uh, addressing requests from uh, profiteering law firms uh, who want drunk, drunk driving um, arrests or, or, or infractions on a daily basis, and they're forced to do all that work. I, I hear that it sounds like a it sounds like a concern, but the, the, ultimately, or if they shut that down, are they going to make it harder for members of the press yeah. and public interest groups to really find out information? Uh, about the, and, uh, the about the spending of government and the operations of government in our police departments. Fred, the the governor gave a speech uh, at the league. I, I'm sorry, I didn't watch it. Did did he say anything in 15 seconds? <laughs> no, I didn't think he said anything. I mean, I obviously <laughs> said things that were significant, but I don't think he said anything momentous. Yeah. Well, anything right. that was unexpected. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, it's time for our only in Jersey Shocking. moments, headlines and notes that are quintessentially Jersey. Charles, you got one for us, right? Yeah, I, I just want to note the passing of uh, Judge Marianne Barry Trump. And it reminded me of this inst uh, moment in 2016 when Chris Christie, then the candidate for president, and that was a candidate again, but in, in 2016, he was humble bragging and name dropping Donald Trump in town halls. And he was, he uh, regaled one audience about how the judge, Marianne Barry Trump called him up and said, uh, Chris, you young brash prosecutor, uh, would you mind having dinner with my baby brother, Donald? <laughs> and Christy loved to tell that story because it brought the crowd into the, you know, into the celebrity world. But, through Marianne Barry Trump, it, she uh, set off one of the most tortured relationships in <laughs> New Jersey political history. Christie went from being uh, enabler to enemy. Oh, Donald Trump. That, that's her legacy, huh? All right. Mine <laughs> comes from the wonderful world of social media, where Democratic gubernatorial candidate Steve Fulop showed a sense of humor at the expense of the funniest lawyer in New Jersey, and exposing how a humorless social media trolls can often be. Here's the post. It says, I'm proud to accept the support of John Bramnick for governor. I think he would make an interesting LG for his bipartisan efforts. Very funny, responded Bramnick. Immediately, the post was bombarded by barbs from followers who didn't get the joke. He's actually not endorsing him. That's the joke. Uh, Fulop is the worst. Bramnick's a traitor. And it went on like that for several posts. People, it's a long way to the next election. Way too soon to be lacking in mirth. And that's Roundtable for this week. Chaz, Lilo, Fred, good to see you all. Thanks. Thanks also to Senator Scatari for joining us. You can follow this show on X at Roundtable NJ. 
and scan the QR code on your screen for full episodes and more. We're off for the Thanksgiving holiday next week. Hope yours is going to be happy. I'm David Cruz for all the crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954. And by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com.